Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Ray Lindley, the Executive Director of Array Global Educational Services. We're excited again to be presenting to you uh, what we think will be an outstanding workshop. Uh, we, uh, we just try to bring the things that you request or that you have indicated uh, would be of real help to you. And so today, and I'm going to let Dr. Jake introduce the workshop in just a moment, but welcome, and we're happy to have you with us. And so uh, let me first of all introduce to you uh, uh, Danny Eichelberger. Danny is the uh, one of the associate directors for Array Global. Wave, Danny, uh, so that uh, everybody knows you're there. And I think uh, Danny has some of his uh, university students who are tuning in today. And, uh, and so we know that there will be a lot of people who will benefit a lot by uh, what we have presented today. And then uh, it's a, always a pleasure to introduce uh, my executive associate director, uh, Dr. Jake Frankham. Uh, Jake and I are used to these Zoom calls. We have several every week, and uh, we're, we're excited about all of the things that are happening with Array Global. And uh, Dr. Jake is going to introduce our workshop today and uh, give a couple of announcements of things that we think you uh, would like to know. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jake, who will give the announcements and then introduce the workshop. Thank you, Dr. Ray. And uh, thanks, Mr. Danny, for joining us also. Uh, this is going to be an exciting time. I know we've had a lot of people ask for this type of workshop to how we can improve our reading, how we can improve our ling English proficiency through reading. Uh, but before we jump into that, before I introduce our presenter today, there have been some different questions that I wanted to talk about with Dr. Ray and I wanted to talk about to make sure that people are clear. We've had a lot of questions about Array Global and the services that we provide, and we are expanding, we're growing. Uh, we have special welcome to those in uh, East Africa, Central Africa, who are joining us today. And then like echoing what Dr. Ray said in uh, welcoming those people from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, being part of this also. So some, some questions that we've had are our external assessment. Um, we can help schools select any kind of external assessment um, we, and we also provide an external assessment on our website. So please get in and, and look at that because there's been a lot of questions about external assessments, probably specifically because this is when external assessments start to take place at the end of the school year in the springtime. And you want to learn how your students have progressed and grown and developed this school year. And it's a great way to really track your school improvement progress. So please, if you need any help on selecting a, an external assessment, we have we're very familiar with the different types of external assessments, and we'd be happy to help you uh, figure out which one's going to be best for you and your school. Also, we've had a lot of questions about what types of schools does uh, Ray Global accredit. We will accredit, uh, obviously, American schools, national schools, if you speak in Arabic, if you speak in Kurdish, if you speak in um, any other kind of African dialect, any types of those schools. If your school pr uh, provides a uh, and an English curriculum like Cambridge or Oxford, we also have accredited those schools. We've accredited uh, Canadian schools, German schools, French schools, um, Australian schools, and we'd be happy to work with, with any of those types of schools because like Dr. Ray says, and I'm stealing his words, uh, a, a, a good school is a good school. It doesn't matter what language it's um, provided in, uh, it still can be a good school. So again, we accredit all types of schools including post-secondary programs. Also, we'd like to have a special welcome today from Ministries of Education. We have uh, several ministers from around the world. We'd like to especially welcome you and, and give you a warm welcome to our, our uh, presentation. We have some awesome upcoming activities. Right now, we have an academic competition. It's an art contest, and the medium of art is photography, and the theme of it is capture kindness. So we want students to go out and take pictures of anything that might represent kindness and submit it to us. That's due by March 1st. And we wanna get as many submissions as possible. It not only is a great way for students to connect with other schools around the world, but it's also a great way to develop kindness as students are learning and growing and developing. Right. We also have a, an opportunity this entire spring. It's called Me and My Community. If students get 20 hours, if they do 20 hours of service, they're able to get recognition, a certification from us, and they'll be part of a special assembly that we're going to be providing in May. 
And so as many of you um, are getting ready for Ramadan, um, if, if that's your religion, Ramadan's a great time for you to have your students go out and do some of this service. And many of you other ones around the, the world, uh, it's an awesome opportunity for students to be able to serve and, and help other people. So make sure you sign up for that. And then also make sure you put on your calendar for March. March, our workshop is going to be a great presentation from two um, very, very qualified administrators. It's going to be on March 19th at the same time. Uh, so please make sure that you join us for that. We'd also like to recognize uh, the school Al Alsun International School in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, was named the February Institution of the Month. And we'd like to put out a special Thank you to them for all their great work in supporting their school, their school and their students that uh, they work so hard to uh, provide a quality education on so many levels. So congratulations, Al Alson. And with that, I want to do just a brief introduction. Um, our presenter today is Mr. John Lant, and he operates schools throughout the West Coast of the United States. And we're uh, really happy to bring everyone here together to review this amazing content um, that Learning Dynamics provides. Uh, I'm a school superintendent in the state of Montana, and we use Learning Dynamics. We hand that out to our parents. They use it. We use it in the classroom. It's an amazing product. It's also being adopted by the big state of Texas. So those of you that are not familiar with uh, United States geography, you have two states to look up now, figure out where Montana is, figure out where uh, Texas is. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to John who can introduce where he's at and some of his background. Thank you, Dr. Franco, I appreciate that. Uh, and welcome to all of you. I'm excited to uh, spend a little bit of time with you and talk a little bit about reading and what we have learned. Um, so I just have to say when we started out, I, I, we jumped on this thing a little bit early and I saw that uh, Dr. Lindley and Dr. Franco were wearing suits and ties, and I'm not, and so I'm a little casual today, but I thought, hey, it's Saturday morning, so at least where we are, it's Saturday morning. Well, John, and so that so that you don't feel too bad, too badly. Uh, a month ago, uh, when we did the workshop, I was in Hawaii, and I had on my Hawaiian shirt, and uh, <laughs> what, what you didn't see is I had on my shorts and flip-flops also, so, you know, <laughs> we accept that. Well, I, I, I'm not wearing shorts. I do have uh, long pants and a shirt, so that's great. <laughs> but I'm, I'm located right now in Arizona, and I know that Dr. Frankham is in Montana, and it's the middle of winter, and he's freezing. And today, we're going to have probably 75 degrees here in Arizona, and I think I'm going to go play golf this afternoon. So sorry about that, Dr. Frankham. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go and enjoy some of the snow that we have. I think Dr. Ray actually has more snow than we do because we've been at about 45 degrees Fahrenheit, so about uh, seven or eight degrees Celsius. Um, but yeah, it is beautiful, but I uh, can't go golfing right now. We can go snowmobiling. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, terrific. Well, let me just uh, introduce you to us. Um, I'm one of the owners and founders of Learning Dynamics. And Learning Dynamics... Um, we have, uh, we're a little bit different than, than other companies. Um, we are not a publishing company. At least we, were, we, we started out not being a publishing company, but we started out as a school company. And um, we have six schools in Arizona and Utah. So we're probably a lot smaller than some of you guys, but we have approximately 2000 kids, about 150 teachers. And we've been doing this for about 38 years. And our focus is on the little kiddos, the early grades, the pre-kinder and kindergarten age students. And so um, when we started out, we thought, you know, we want to be the best school in the country. And in order to do that, we thought we need to be able to teach these kids um, some really good stuff. We need to teach them to do math. We need to teach them how to read. And, um, and we thought if we can teach kids to read, then families will, register their kids with our schools and our business will be great. So that was kind of our philosophy of how we started this thing. We decided to focus on reading. And so um, about that time when we made this, this decision to focus on reading, we came across some of the statistics nationally here in the United States. The organization that produces those statistics is called NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And that is a federal organization that goes out and they test all of the kids in the United States when they're in about 
third grade. So what is that? That's ages, is that age about 10? Is that what that is, Dr. Frankham? Something like that? And yeah. that's when they, they do a test and they find out how are these kids doing? Are they performing on grade level? And what they have reported is that only 35% of third grade children in the United States can read on grade level. That means 65% of kids cannot read on grade level by the third grade. And we were, we were um, stunned by that figure. Well, the latest figure that came out from the NAEP, I believe this last year showed 35% of kids are reading on grade level. So for the last 50 years, that graph has been completely flat. There has been tons of money dumped into the educational market. Billions of dollars dumped into reading and how do we teach children to read? And the statistics are completely flat, wavering between 35 and 38% of kids being able to read on a grade level. So we thought, okay, this is a good focus. Let's focus on teaching kids to read. What we did as a company is we went out and we found all of the reading programs that we could. We contacted publishers, we got their reading programs, we brought them in house and we started to analyze them. We started to try and use them. And we realized very quickly that uh, those products did not work. And so we weren't surprised that so few kids were reading. We thought this, this, this is crazy. We can't use this stuff. As an example, one of the big publishers um, in the United States, they produce a set of reading books and they call them their leveled one readers. They're the first reading books that go out to these kids. And we opened up the very first book and it was very simple. It had one word per page and it had like four or five pages and that was it. So basically four or five words in the entire book. Well, we opened it up and the very first page had a picture of a seashore, a beach. And the one word at the bottom said seashore. We opened up that book, we looked at that word and said, this is the first book the kids are reading. We closed the book, we dropped it and we said, that doesn't work, kids can't read that. If you think about it, for a child to read the word seashore, they have to know that S makes the S sound at the beginning of the word, but yet in the middle of the word, the SH together makes the digraph sound of SH, SH, in the word C, S E A, the E is a long E with a silent A, a long O in shore with a silent E at the end that doesn't make any sound. And we thought, this is impossible for little kids to read this book. So we realized that we need to write our own materials and develop our own reading program. Um, so that's what we did. We started into, uh, uh, into the schools and we said, okay, let's develop our own reading program. Let's develop, bring all of our teachers together Let's start working with the kids. And every week we would take materials in with the kids. Then we would come back as a group of teachers and we would talk about it, what worked, what didn't work. We would tweak it, we would make changes. And then we would go back into the classroom and work with the kids. And then the next week we would come back, we would tweak it. And that way we started to develop a reading program where the kids actually could read. Um, and we're gonna show that to you here in a minute. And we're gonna, I'm gonna share with you what we learned about reading and teaching kids. But we thought that it would take about a year for us to develop this product and this reading program for little kids. Well, 17 years later, we finally had a reading program that worked. It took us 17 years working with kids in, in the classroom, coming out and, and talking about it and counseling together and then tweaking it and then going back into the classroom 17 years it took us, and we did that without thinking of making $1. We had no interest in selling the reading program. All we wanted to do was develop a reading program that worked so that families would bring their kids to our schools because their kids learned how to read. Well, what we discovered is that the reading program that we developed is developed the way that kids think. And you see, that's different because all of these big publishers out there their reading program is developed by really smart PhDs. And these big publishers, they have board of directors that run their companies. And the board of directors said, we gotta have a reading program to sell to our customers, go develop it. And they hire PhDs to go develop it. Well, the problem with that, that we found is that PhDs think really smartly. They, they, they think like smart PhDs. A PhD does not think like a four-year-old kid. 
And so the reading programs that we found on the market were developed the way that adults think, where our reading program is developed the way that kids think. And as I get in and show you the program, I'll point out a few of the things of why it works and, and, and that th this is what kids saw as opposed to what we thought as adults. But that's the primary difference of why learning dynamics works so well. And so then at the point where we had to develop, we had people come in, we had Dr. Susan B. Newman come in and visit us. Dr. Susan B. Newman was the former Assistant Secretary of Education in the United States under President George Bush. And she came in and met with us and she looked at the reading program. She said, this is the strongest reading program I've ever seen. And she sat down and basically these kids were just reading to her. So it's, it's pretty cool, it's pretty exciting. Since that time, um, okay, okay, so let me just back up. So we developed the reading program just for our schools. Well, we had a group in California that heard about it and they flew out and met with us and they, and, and they said, we wanna see your reading program. And we thought, okay. So they came and met with us and all we did is we just brought little kids in, four year, four year old, five year old little kids. We just said, hey, come in and read. And they just sat and they just read to, uh, to this California group. And the California group couldn't believe it. They looked at us and said, so you know, can we buy this program? And our first response was no, <laughs> no. This is, we're using this in our school, you can't, no one can have this, right? But over time, we started to think, you know what, maybe we can make this available for other, for other schools and other children. And, um, and so we started to sell it into school districts. Dr. Franca mentioned we've got it working with them up in Montana and a number of school districts up there, districts in California, districts in Arizona, districts in New Mexico. And then we met with the state of Texas. And the state of Texas looked at this and said, this is incredible. We want every one of our pre-kinder, kindergarten, and first grade students to learn to read on this. And so um, we've signed a deal with the state of Texas where they are adopting this. And this first year, we're gonna have probably about a third, which is a little under half a million kids in Texas that are going to be learning to read with the Learning Dynamics Reading Program. So bottom line is this stuff is cool. This stuff works. And I'm excited to show you um, and dive into the philosophies of reading and how this program adheres to those philosophies of reading and why it works so well. Now. Some of you, um, I mean, you might see this reading program and say, okay, yeah, that was pretty cool. But, but what I want you to draw away from this, um, this little uh, training or this, this webinar is, is I want you to understand what the science of reading really is and what it means and how you apply that to a young student who's learning to read. Regardless of what program you're using, understand the principles of reading, okay? All right, so to start out with, we found a study um, that was produced by the National Reading Panel. That is a, a group that was um, uh, funded by the federal government here in the United States to go out and conduct research on what the key elements of learning to read are. And as we looked at this, they're really pretty good. There's five key principles of learning to read that the National Reading Foundation has identified and we believe. The first one is phonics. The second principle is called phonemic awareness. And I'll talk about the difference between those two in just a minute. So phonics, phonemic awareness, then we have fluency, and then, oh, I'm sorry. Then we have number three is vocabulary, number four is fluency, and number five is comprehension. Those are the critical pieces in learning to read. Now, what we actually discovered with, with our company and over the 17 years is that there's actually one more. And, and I think the National Reading Panel takes the sixth one and combines it with their stuff, but we've separated it out. And that one is called blending and decoding. Kids need to have that blending and decoding skills. So I'm gonna talk about what each one of those means. Okay, first of all, phonics. What is phonics? What, what, uh, what does that mean? Phonics is very simple. It simply means that a letter has a name and a sound. So for instance, this is the letter A and A has a sound. The sound that we start teaching kids with is the short vowel sound, which is A. Ah. So basically this is the letter A and A says A. Ah. Okay, like in alligator or ant. 
Okay, so that's phonics. Kids need to learn that words are made up of letters and letters have sounds associated with them. Very simple. And again, why, why, does, this, why does this work? Because that's how kids think. That's what we learned. That's how kids think, okay? So this isn't A, it says A. Ah. That is called phonics. Now, the second step is phonemic awareness. So what's the difference between phonics and phonemic awareness? Well, phonemic awareness is exactly like it says. It's being aware of the phoneme. A phoneme means sound, being aware of the sound. Or in other words, can you hear the sound of a ah in the word alligator? Can you hear that beginning sound, alligator? Or in the word cat, can you hear the beginning sound of k and the middle sound of a ah and the ending sound of t in the word cat? That's phonemic awareness, being able to hear those sounds, beginning, middle, and ending sounds in a word. Well, that's a skill that needs to be explicitly taught to young students. Because when kids learn to speak, all they know is this is a book, or this is a, this is a mug, or this is a table or a chair. They, they don't learn uh, to hear the beginning, middle, and ending sounds in these words. And so phonemic awareness is a skill that needs to be explicitly taught to children in learning to read. Okay, so let me show you what we do with our program. All right, first of all, we have a lesson manual that the teachers follow. Now I know you can't, I'm gonna open this up and I, I know it's too small, you're not gonna be able to read it, but I, I can at least show you how it works, okay? so. If you open up the lesson manual, which you can't see, that's okay. We teach one letter at a time, one letter in, in one lesson. That's all we teach in a lesson is one letter. Each lesson takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And we recommend the kids do three lessons a week. So that's not very much. It's simple. Three lessons a week, 20 minutes a lesson is all they do, okay? One, the first lesson we teach is the letter M. We do not teach in alphabetical order. The first five letters we teach are M, A, P, S, and T. Now, there's a reason why we do this. The reason why we teach that is because we want the kids to start learning to read quickly. So in other words, if we teach kids the letter M, A, P, S, and T, the first five letters, and, um, oh, okay, hold, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm gonna hold that thought. I'm gonna backtrack a minute. Let me show you how the lessons work, how we teach the letter M. Then I'm gonna tell you why we teach it out of alphabetical order, okay? Okay, so basically the way we teach um, the program, every program is in the exact same format. And I know you can't read it, that's okay. In the beginning, we, we give instructions to the teacher. We tell the teacher to pull out the, the flashcards so I'm gonna, let me see if I can, I should have opened this beforehand, I apologize. I'm gonna open up these flashcards. We tell her to get out the letter M. Okay, right here, we've got the letter M. And then we have these little pop-out figures that come with the program. So we tell them to pop out this letter M, which is this little Morty Mouse character. Okay, now the teacher is ready to teach the program. Okay, in the beginning of the lesson, we tell the teachers to, when they teach the letter M, that M says M. M does not say M, M-U-H. M says M. The letter C says K, does not say K. R does not say R, it says R, okay? So if they were reading the word car, they don't read ka-ra, they read car, k-a-r, okay? So we teach the sounds of the letters correctly. What they do is the teacher says, she starts out and basically says, this is the letter M. So here's the phonics. There's a big M or a capital M, and there's a lowercase M or a little M. 
M says M. Mm. Then we ask the children, what letter is this? M. What does it say? M. Mm. Good job. And give them lots of feedback. That's phonics, explicitly teaching the sounds of the letters. Okay. Then we tell them a story about a little mouse named Morty Munching Mouse. Now, when I tell you, this is, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm the teacher. Okay, guys, when I tell you this story, I want you to see if you can hear the sound of mmm in this story. And they'll have the kids gathered around them, okay? And then they'll tell the story about Morty Mouse. And the story goes like this. Morty Munching Mouse loves to munch, 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 munch. Can you hear the sound of mmm in the story? The kids will all be, yeah. And maybe you say, okay, raise your hand when you hear the sound of mmm. Morty, mouse, and then you continue on with the story that is written in the lesson manual, okay? Okay, what are we teaching the kids? Phonemic awareness. We're explicitly teaching the kids to start to hear the sound of mmm, the letter M, in words like mouse, munching, okay? So whatever program you guys are using, Make sure that you teach the kids, this is the letter M, it says M, mm, and then teach them to hear that sound in words. You can make up a story about whatever, okay? A mouse named Mark who likes to play with marbles, I don't know, whatever. But, but basically we're teaching them phonics and now we're teaching them phonemic awareness. Okay, the next step in the lesson is we then have a song that the kids can sing that is all about the letter M, all right? Um, what if I can play? Let me see if I can just pull this up real quick. If I, I might have this where I can possibly play the letter M song for you so you can hear how this works. Let's see here. Um, okay, let's see if you can hear this. The letter M. Here's the sound of M, mm, 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 like munching muffins. Okay, and so on. So then we have music that teaches the letter M and the sound of M. Mm. Okay, now why do we? Why did we do this? The reason why we did this is because remember we developed this in the classroom with kids, and we realized that some kids are right-brained and some kids are left-brained. Some kids learn and respond to things analytically like math or just tell them this is the letter M, it says M, mm, and they're like, okay, I got it. And other kids need to associate it with a story or with music, that's how they learn better. See, our goal, our goal at Learning Dynamics was not how do we increase that the, 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 the percentage of kids reading from 35% up to 50. That's still an F. That's still failing. Our goal was how do we teach every single child to read? Everyone. Okay. So we have different approaches to teaching the sound. We have just tell them what it is. We have a story about Morty Mouse. Um, let me see. I think I have a different, let me show you a bigger picture of Morty Mouse. I'm sorry, that, that picture is so small that I just showed you. Uh, here we are. Okay, a story about Morty Mouse. Um, so we have different ways to help these kids remember the sounds of the letter. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so, um, so that's basically how the lessons are taught. And every lesson is in the same format. So once a teacher teaches the first lesson, she knows how to teach every lesson thereafter. Just follow the lesson manual. Every lesson's exactly the same. And the kids learn all the sounds of the letters. Okay, now. John, can I just interrupt you for a second? Yes, yes. Uh, there's a comment on the uh, uh, chat yep. that says, uh, this is for English teachers. Now, I think we all know that in a school, everybody teaches English, math, science, whatever. This isn't just for English teachers, right? 
this is teaching children to read. Um, and, and it is, obviously it is an English reading program. I mean, we do have the program translated into Spanish. The reading, the reading principles are the same. The kids need to learn that letters make sounds and then they need to learn how to put those letters together to read words. And then they need to get into reading books mm-hmm. using the letters and sounds that they've learned. Right. And so, 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 so translating it to other subject matter, let's take a science class. If the science teacher knows that the English teacher is working on the letter M, the M mm sound, maybe when the science teacher is talking about mercury, the science teacher could say, we know that in your other class, you're learning the M sound or M sound mercury. That's the same. So some kind of tie-in sometimes will be very helpful to uh, spread the learning across the whole curricula. Yeah, sure, sure, exactly. That's just re-emphasizing the the skills that they've learned. That's exactly right. right. Okay, so what I have shown you is just the very first lesson, how a lesson works. Okay, now here, here is where learning dynamics is different than anyone else out there in the market that we have seen. And that is that after five letters and sounds, M, A, P, S, and T, we then teach the blending and decoding process. In other words, if a child knows that the letter A says A ah, and the letter M says M, mm, then let's teach that child to read the word am, right? I mean, these kids are smart. Most of these kids can run your home entertainment center. Almost every one of these kids can pick up an iPad and flip through the iPad and find the, the, the app that they're looking for and open it up and do whatever they're doing, play a game or, or run the app and shut it down. These kids are smart. And we realized as we worked with these kids that all of a sudden this was really easy. They know that A says A, ah, M says M, mm, let's teach them to read the word am, okay? With five letters and sounds, M, A, P, S, and T, they can now read the word am, Sam, Pam, Matt, Sat, Pat, At, right? All of a sudden, kids can start to apply the learning to reading. Let me explain to you how we teach this blending concept. Okay, what we do is we teach the children, and and we have found, guys, We have found that this, what I'm about to explain to you is absolutely magical. These kids, it just resonates with the way that kids think. Okay, in our mouths, this is what we teach. In our mouths, did you know that we have a little motor? And if I turn the motor on, I can make a sound last longer. And if I turn the sound, the motor off, then the sound stops. Listen to how I do this, okay. This is A, A says ah. I'm gonna turn on the motor. Ready, go. Ah, stop. And I turn the motor off. Okay, ready, go. Turn it on again. Ah, stop. And then we play games with the kids. You know, do it shorter or longer. Okay, ready, go. Ah, and do it as long until kids start passing out, falling on the ground or whatever. But, uh, you know, they get the idea And they they understand that as long as that motor is on, that that sound continues. Now, did you know that when we put two sounds together, in order to read, we have to keep the motor running between these two sounds. Now, listen to what happens if I stop the motor between the sounds. Okay, ready? I turn on the motor. Ah, stop. Mm, stop. See, that doesn't work. But if I keep the motor running between those sounds and do not turn that motor off, listen to what happens. Okay, ready? Then you turn the motor on with the kids. Ready? Go. Um, see how that motor kept running? Okay, let's do it a little faster. Um, um, um. Can you hear a word in there? Am. And the kids would be like, am. And their faces light up and make a huge deal about it and be like, yeah, great. You read your first word. 
okay? That is how we teach the blending concept. And we teach it with only five letters, M, A, P, S, and T. So who cares about the letter K and the letter L and the letter Q at this point? Let's just, just teach five letters and sounds and get them, teach them the blending concept and get them to start reading words. It's magical. When I was in business school, getting my master's degree in business, they taught us, if you're going to make a presentation to the board of directors, only give them three or four bullet points. Do not give them more than that because they can't remember more than that. Well, okay. So let's do the same thing with kids. Let's teach them five letters and teach them to start to read. And all of a sudden the kids can read with just the five letters that they've learned and they go nuts. It is so exciting. So many of you on this, on this call right now, you have taught kids to read and you have seen that visible change when a child sounds out that first word, there is a visible change in their countenance, in their demeanor. The light goes on and they're like, am, am, and they're so excited. They just broke that little code and they read that word. And it's super cool. Okay, so five letters and sounds, then we teach them the blending concept. Then when they learn the sixth letter, B, G, and H are the next three, but when they learn the sixth letter, then you practice blending all six letters. When you learn the seventh letter, you practice making words of all seven letters. Now, only do three letter words. Don't get into four letter words yet because it's just a little bit complicated. So just stick with three letter words in the beginning. And then they learn eight letters. They can now read words with all eight letters that they have learned. Okay, now here is where another thing that makes what we have discovered at Learning Dynamics different than everything out there. And that is that after eight letters and sounds, we introduce the kids to their very first reading book. They've only learned eight letters. M, A, P, S, T, B, G, and H. That's it. We've taught them the blending and decoding skills so they can sound out words. And now we're gonna give them their very first reading book, which uses only the eight letters and sounds that they have learned. So you open this up. On the inside of the front cover, here's the words in the book. You can sound out the words with the kids and then have them read the book. Pam, they sound it out. Have them read their, it's okay for them to use their little reading finger to sound it out. Pam, okay? That helps them with the motor and the mouth concept. Use the reading finger as you're, as you're reading. Pam, because that helps them keep that motor running as you go to the next letter. They'll get out of that. Actually, here's an interesting thing. A couple of years ago, I decided to take a speed reading course. And I, I got with this company. And I know the owner of the company and I'm like, hey, I wanna do your speed reading course, this is cool. And the very first thing he had me do is start reading words with my finger again to keep my pace, to go faster. So it's okay if kids are using their finger, Pam, okay? Then the next page, hat, bag, and Sam, okay? Their very first book, they've only learned, it only uses the eight letters and sounds they have success reading it, they go nuts. Okay, now I told you that we, we learned, we developed this program in the classroom, the way that kids think. Okay, here's something that we learned in the process. This actually was not our very first book. The very first book actually is what we call book number four in our set now. Pam has the hat. This book only uses the eight letters and sounds. All right, kids can read every word in here, except as you get to this, you open it up, here's the new words. But down here, notice this, this says sight words. And here are two sight words, a uh and has. We just tell the kids, if you see the letter A by itself, it says a uh or a, however you wanna teach them. Has, H-A-S, is a sight word. Why is it a sight word? because S is making the Z sound. We just taught them that S says S as in snake. Well, now we can't show them a word that says has 
where S makes the Z sound, that totally confuses kids. And that's what all the other publishers do. But we said, okay, look, okay, this is a sight word. It doesn't follow the rules. If you see it, it says has. Don't sound it out. No motor in the mouth, just has, okay? So then they read. We thought, well, the kids ought to be able to read this. They can sound out every single word. But when we gave this to the kids, they could not read it. Every single kid was stumped. And we learned that it's because it's a book, their first book, because it's a full sentence with punctuation marks, periods. It just overwhelmed them. Even though the kids had the ability to read this book, it was overwhelming to them. And so we said, okay, let's go back. That's when we said, let's make this the first book. Pam, it's super easy. And then the second book we did was a hat. Super easy, two words per page. Pam taps, Sam sat. Then we did the third book, which is called Sam. And this one has two to three words per page. Still no punctuation, no periods, no sentences. And then by the time the kids got this, book one, two, three, then we gave them this and every single kid could read it and just took off. So those are things that we never would have known. A PhD would look at that and say, oh yeah, the children have the skills to sound, they know all those letters and sounds, just uses eight. They know how to blend, they should be able to read that. Well, that's not how kids think, kids couldn't do it. That's why learning dynamics is so powerful. It was developed in the classroom the way that kids think. And that's why it took us 17 years to do it. So then basically, um, after the kids learn that very, get into their first reading book, right? They've learned eight letters and sounds, they get into their first reading book, just continue with the program. They learn another letter, another sound, another letter and another sound. Then they get into the next reading book and so on. And the program just goes all the way to the end. By the time you get to the end of the program, the kids are reading. They understand long vowels, short vowels, consonants. They understand digraphs. I know you can't see this, but it's uh, this is about the level that the kids are getting to. Okay, so it's about an advanced second grade reading level. And we introduce this to all kids in preschool, kindergarten, and first grade. By the time they've gone through this, they're reading well above their grade level. And the next step after this is the public library. Just go get books. <clears throat> okay, now, after the kids read a book, at the end of the book, we have comprehension questions. I know you can't read it, that's okay. Just, this is where they are. The last cover of the book, we have comprehension questions where we ask the kids, about what they read. Some of the questions are objective. What happened? What happened first? What happened next? Other questions are more subjective. Why do you think this happened? What would happen if? To get the kids to start to think a little bit. So, so that's it, you know? So that focuses on phonics, phonemic awareness, blending and decoding, vocabulary, comprehension, and fluency. And, and that's how, um, and that's what we have learned. Those are the critical steps in teaching kids to read. That is the science to reading. But what we found was missing was, yeah, everybody teaches letters and sounds, but after five letters and sounds, you teach the blending concept. Nobody was doing that. We found that piece was missing. And then we found books. We could not find books that just uses the skills that the kids have learned. As my example in the beginning, seashore. There's no way a kid can read that. An S at the beginning, a digraph in the middle, a, a long vowel with a silent E, they don't have those skills. So these books are perfectly clean that takes them all the way through learning all of that and reading with success. So that's pretty much how that works. That's how I've showed you how the program works. But more importantly, regardless of what you're using, the science of reading, of explicitly teaching phonics, that letters make sounds, put those sounds together to make words, get them reading materials early on with the skills that they've been taught and focusing on comprehension with the kids is, is how these little kids have read. And now as a result, like I said, in our schools, we have about 2000 kids. The expectation is every single child leaves reading. Now. Granted, you guys know this, that if you have a class of 25 kids, 25 students, you have 25 different speeds, right? 
Kids learn at different speeds, at different levels, and that's okay. That's okay. And so the kids are all reading. Some of them are reading in the green books, reading really well. Others are just reading the short vowel books. Others are reading the long vowel books, but they're reading, they understand those concepts and those principles. And so as we sit down the school districts, like uh, Dr. Frankham's in Montana, they see this, they're like, wow, this is incredible. We sit down at the state of Texas. They said, this is incredible. We've never seen anything like this. And so now they're saying, we want every one of our pre-K, kindergarten and first grade kids to learn to read on this program. So that's, that's it. That is the science of reading. That's the application of the science of reading. And more importantly, guys, this is, this is how kids learn. This is how kids think. Now it is research-based. It's not just, hey, this is how kids learn. The University of Oregon came in and they wrote the research base behind this. The University of Oregon is in the United States. They are one of the leading universities for early literacy in the US. And they, they matched up the, the research with this reading program with the science of reading perfectly. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so that's all I have. So maybe we can open it up for questions or yeah. Uh, Dr. Ray or Dr. Frankham, how would you like to go? Yeah, I think so there, there, there have been some questions that have been coming up. And, I, and some I've been- good ones. And by the way, Frankham. first of all, uh, for Tony and me, thank you for mentioning the University of Oregon. Uh, <laughs> Tony, who is on here, he and I are both from Oregon. Uh, so anyway, thank you for mentioning. And you know, one of the questions, excuse me, Dr. Jake, that, that has come up, uh, well, two questions that maybe you could speak to. Number one, why did you choose the letters that you did to begin? That's question number one. And question number two, uh, we have some people who are saying, well, what about students in upper grades? And and I I think I have an answer for that question, but I'd like, John, like you to speak to that. So two questions. Why did you choose the letters you did to begin with? And secondly, what about students in the upper grades? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, and it's very easy. The reason why we chose those letters is because they're some of the most commonly used letters um, in reading, M, A, P, S, and T. Um, and so uh, we just thought, you know, what are the most common letters? And partially it was, okay, we need some letters to form words so that we can write a book. <laughs> you know? so, so we've got to use the letters that can make the most words. And then as we went online, we actually did a study and said, what are the most common sounds and it's been a long time, but I've, I found the study, M, A, P, S, and T were like the first five. So yeah, those are, those are some of the most common sounds. So we started with those in order to then be able to teach the blending concept, the motor and the mouth concept, and then the kids could start reading, right? So that's why we chose those. They're, they're just very, very common sounds. Now, uh, the second question, what about kids that are in older grades? Okay, that... That's a very good question. And, and let me answer it in a couple of ways. Um, kids in older grades who struggle, because obviously, as I've just explained, you know, this program, we sit down with a kid in sixth grade and say, this is an M, it says, mm. the kid's gonna look at you and go, I know that, right? The problem is, is that these kids who are a little bit older and who are struggling, we don't know what they're struggling with. If we could identify exactly where the holes were in that child's learning, we could go in and teach those concepts and they could take off, but we don't know. And the child doesn't know. And so it really is a good idea to start over and learn the letters and sounds. And maybe you go through it just a little faster with those kids. Learn the letters and sounds, learn the blending and decoding process, get into the reading books and fill in those gaps of what they've been missing. Now, one of the things that we have found to be very successful is that we will take, let's say we have a sixth grade student who is struggling with reading. We'll get that sixth grade student in, and then we'll get a kindergarten student in, and we'll match them together and we'll say, okay, sixth grader, we want you to teach this program to the kindergartner. And so we use this student who is struggling and, and of course, a teacher who's there to help with intervention is going to be overseeing this, but use this kid, the older child, to teach the younger child the program. And in the process, the older child learns the materials and he feels like he's smart 
And he feels like, hey, I'm teaching this kid to read, even though the teacher just told him, okay, tell him this is M, it says M. Mm. So then the kid turns around and teaches the younger kid. He's learning it as he passes it on and his confidence stays high and he feels good about himself. We have found that to be very successful. All right, my turn to ask some questions, Dr. Ray. Go for it. Ah, uh, okay, good. Uh, there was a comment in here, uh, John, about I'm finding it difficult to teach the sound C as in city or car and just wanted to see what your thoughts are and how we can, uh, how she can best teach this. Okay, that's a great question. Um, to start out with, this particular, from our experience, this is a beginning reading program that teaches consonants, short vowels, long vowels, diagraphs, and we do teach the soft G and the soft C sound, okay? So we actually do get into, this is called the race. So we do teach this, okay? We don't teach everything though, as you, as you can see. We don't teach uh, irregulars. We don't teach endings like ing ending and things like that. Okay, so to answer the question, um, from our experience, it's important to teach the kids, first of all, start with one. We start with the hard C. C says K, as in cat. And then we get them to sound out words. And then we get them to read. And all they're using is cat. We haven't even introduced them to the, uh, the soft C like in city or race. So we just teach them and give them lots of experience. That's another reason why this program is so great because we have 53 reading books here, guys, 53 reading books. And we don't, they don't even see a soft C in this thing until book 52. So by that time, they've got a ton of experience. And then we introduce the soft C and teach them the rule associated with the soft C and then give them a book to read so they can start practicing that. So it is a little bit difficult to teach uh, multiple concepts at once, hard C, soft C at once, a kid's gonna, gonna be confused. The letter A says A and A, ah. guess what? It also says ah, as in father. Well, what else says ah? The letter O, as in octopus. Okay, now kids, are, their minds are just like, they don't get it. So teach them one concept, give them lots of practice before you introduce another concept. So I'm assuming that answers. I don't know if she wanted me to go into what the soft C rule is, right? Maybe, I mean, I guess you can probably, let me see what we do here. You can go ahead and ask another question while I'm looking up the soft C rule. Okay, I, uh, another one I think is, a, is pretty simple. Um, just people want to know where, what is the best time to start teaching students using this program? What age level, what grade level? Um, the, the best way to start, um, it, it's, it's really, it's at the point where the child is ready to start learning. And so um, we have found typically that it's about one year before kindergarten. Kids can get it. One year before kindergarten, these kids are flying. Certainly by kindergarten age, these kids better be getting into this. By first grade, you're now into intervention. So with Texas, we're going into their pre-kinder, which is one year before kindergarten. We're going into kindergarten and we're also going into first grade because it's just, there's so many kids moving in and out that may not have gotten it. That that's, and the program does take them up to about an advanced second grade reading level. So pre-K, kinder and first grade is really the sweet spot. But the principles are the same no matter how old the child is, follow the science of reading, phonics, phonemic awareness, blending and decoding, all that stuff. No matter what age they are, that's how you start learning to read. Yeah, that's awesome. I especially liked how you said, it, it just depends on the kid. I mean, when you have 25 students in a classroom, they are all, you're all going at 25 different speeds. And yeah. it's the same thing when you start implementing this with, with your child. Uh, John, there's a lot of questions about how this program can be applicable to non-native English language students. And uh, part of that question is, do you have a uh, ELL program? Or are you thinking about an ELL program? You know, the challenge with ELL is there's so many different um, languages, right? English is language, e English language learners. Um, they're coming from different backgrounds of learning different languages. But regardless of that, this principle, these principles will teach them to read a word in English. 
what this program does not do is it does not teach them that, um, okay, so for instance, in this first book, okay, it will teach them that this is hat. In English, H-A-T is hat, and this is what a hat is. It does not teach them that hat means gorro in Spanish, right? Or whatever other language word. So it doesn't go into that, but it will teach them the fundamentals of learning to read in English. And then as the kids are just learning to speak English, they'll know how to read it. The vocabulary will start to come and they'll start to develop that over time. You know, so I, it is focused much more on the reading and breaking the reading code as opposed to vocabulary lists of hat means this in this language or that in another language or whatever. We don't do that at all. Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, Couple things, John. Uh, number one, you'll be pleased. There have been several uh, people who have written, "How can I get this program?" <laughs> and uh, and that that will that should make you happy. And, and the second thing is, uh, especially Dr. Jake and I have visited in several countries. We we learned. Uh, I even can tell the difference between Arabic spoken in Saudi Arabia and Arabic spoken in English. So wow. anyway, or in, excuse me, in Egypt. And so. Uh, one of the things we know is that most people are very hungry to learn how American English sounds. And what you're teaching here is how America, there, there are certain sound, sounds in Arabic that I really still have trouble with. Uh, the sound in Ahmed, that's a, that's a hard one for me because that comes from here somewhere. But anyway, what this is doing, even with the older learner, fifth, sixth, seventh, even through high school or adults, people are learning the, because they want to speak in the English that's understandable in American English. So I think that's why this would be helpful. So I, I just wanted to make that comment. And John, uh, would you mind uh, go in the chat room, please, or perhaps Dr. Jake can do this and put, how can they get this material? Okay, you can send an email to scott at ldreading.com and I just posted it. Um, and then he can, he can uh, find out a little bit more about what you're interested in and talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, I, I'm looking at a couple of comments. Um, now they're starting to go, so hopefully I don't miss them. But you know, one says, little learners should be eager to know meaning as well as reading. That is absolutely crucial. And so as a teacher, as you're teaching kids to read, that's the purpose of these comprehension questions at the back of the books, is to talk about the meaning because that's the whole that's that's the whole purpose kids need to learn to read but then they, they need to read to learn right i mean that's why we want to read is so that we can learn so they need to know vocabulary they need to understand comprehension so take time discussing things and as you're reading the book the books with the kids you can talk about this you know you you read things like uh, whatever the whatever the storyline is this one says um the cub runs to the edge of the tall grass. My name is Skip. I am lost. Well, what, what's a cub? What is the tall grass? Why do you think he's lost? You know, you can start, you can have these conversations with the kids as the students are reading the materials to help them with the comprehension and the vocabulary as well. Um, another comment I'm seeing is that this is very different from whole language. Yes. Com well, here's the thing. Whole language, the way whole language works is you give a kid a book, he opens it up and he starts to read the book. He learns to read by reading. Like for instance, the books, Dick and Jane, Run, Spot, Run, See, See, Spot, Run, whatever. That's whole language where you learn to read not based on the rules and sounding out, but it's more memorizing and you're reading. And the reason for whole language is because kids love to read books. They're excited about that. Open up a book, I'm gonna read it, this is great. Phonics, on the other hand, has historically been kill and drill. A says ah, M says mm, B says b, whatever, right? And kids just are done with drills and exercises and they never get into books. That's why they hate phonics. So what we found is a perfect mesh and combination of teach them phonics, but then integrate the books. So it's really a beautiful mixture of phonics and then the literature piece of whole language and that is what drives the success. Good question. Okay, other, other questions you guys want me to address?
Uh, well, Dr. Ray, why don't we start wrapping it up right now? And then okay. when I post the survey, um, we can, and people, as they're filling out the survey, we can uh, answer some of the other questions. I've been keeping track of some of the questions. Yeah. And that's great. And uh, John, I, I want to double check the uh, email address that you put in, Scott at LD. If they want to ask you personally a specific question, is this the email address they would use? No, my personal, I'll give you my personal email. It's John C. Lant at Gmail. Uh, and I'll just type it in here. Oops. John Sealand at Gmail. Yeah, there's my personal email. So if you have a question for me, that's great. If it's product that you want product, um, I'm just going to send you to Scott. He's the guy who can get you the pricing and the product and shipping and all that stuff. He handles all that. But yeah, that's that's my personal email. If you have a question, great. So yeah. what we'll do is we'll uh, we'll uh, we'll wrap this up for now. Uh, and uh, I, I just uh, encourage you again, if your school has not already considered accreditation for your school by Array Global, we encourage you to uh, join the others who are already joining us. The kinds of services that we give, you've, if you've been watching our workshops for over two years now, uh, this is the kind of help that we try to give schools. When we come into schools, we try to present all of the opportunities that we can for schools to enter. So uh, arrayglobal.org, if you would like to know more about our accreditation process. Now, especially for Farouz, because Farouz asked me last time, okay, Dr. Ray, you always have something inspirational to say at the end. And so nobody else has to listen, but this is for Farouz. I recently ran into a book in, entitled Dear Teacher. And uh, I'm going to, um, I just put it on the uh, chat room, Dear Teacher by uh, Brad Johnson and Hal Bowman. Now, this is other than the area of reading, okay? Uh, however, the kinds of things that uh, John has talked about will certainly be uh, improved. And chapter one, and here, here's the phrase that I want you to keep in your heads right now. Chapter one is titled this, and I love it. Love what you teach, but love who you teach more. Love what you teach, but love who you teach more. And in the very first chapter of the book, they make this statement. And so I encourage you to remember, love what you teach, but uh, love who you teach. And they make this statement in the very first chapter. This doesn't mean that you will like every student in fact, you will have some students who will get on your last nerve and drive you crazy. But that doesn't mean you don't love them as a human or want the best for them. In fact, here's important. These are the ones who probably need love the most. Doesn't mean you don't love them, but they're the ones who might need their love the most. So love what you teach, but love who you teach more. So that's uh, Farouz for you, my friend, and uh, for everybody else. That's my uh, thought for the day. Things like this really inspire me, and they can you to remember it's it's you know yeah reading is really important. It's basic, but love the students. They'll they'll come along just fine. I think John has probably exemplified that well today. They'll come fine if we treat them right. Okay. Uh, all right. So before we get into some more questions, I posted the survey um, in the chat um, all, and also our newsletter. Please get into our newsletter. We always give some good ideas on things you can implement right into your school, right into your classroom. It's posted in the chat on Facebook and then also um, on the Zoom. Um, getting into some other questions, John, as we give people some time to listen and also fill out the survey. One question was, uh, should teachers begin teaching by pronouncing vowels before consonants, or is there no difference? What do you think? Well, again, um, the principle behind this is you want to teach just a small handful of letters and sounds so that they can then start to blend and read words. So in order to read a word, you have to have some vowels and you have to have some consonants, right? So one of the questions I saw, was it short vowels or long vowels? we focus on the short vowels first. So I would teach them a handful of consonants and a couple of vowels, start reading with that, and then just start to add you know, different consonants and different vowels until you've got all of the letters and sounds. Focusing on just the consonants and just the short vowels. 
Then the second step after that would be long vowels. So you introduce long vowels. And then after long vowels, I would then introduce uh, consonant blends. Consonant blends would be things like BR. So it's just putting things together, BR or BL or, or you know, STR for string, stuff like that. And then the fourth one would be digraphs after that. So consonants, short vowels, long vowels, consonant blends, digraphs. That's kind of the order that we do it in. Okay, because that was a similar question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it said, after teaching short vowels, shall I teach long vowels next or separate by the digraphs? So yep, yeah, long that, vowels. yeah, that came up a couple of times. Um, and one person said, I have, problem I have a problem teaching short vowels. Do you have any input or thoughts on that? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know. The, the different, there, there's lots of maybe different strategies. I don't know all the strategies. The strategies we use, obviously, are with music and with stories, you know, where they can hear that sound. Um, so I don't, I don't know. And, and that's, a, that's the only sound we introduce to the kids first. So, so we haven't mixed up the long vowel sound, you know? So in the word made, M-A-D-E or M-A-D for mad, it, it just says ah. And so it, it's the same as if we were to teach a consonant. M says mm, A says ah. That's, that's all we teach and focus on until they've learned all the consonants. And then we get into the longer vowels where we're now saying, hey, this letter actually has a couple of sounds, right? Yeah, that's great. I had a, a question from Dara from Iraqi Kurdistan, Sulaimania. I've been there a couple of times, a beautiful place. Uh, how can we encourage our pupils to read a lot and make reading a factor to increase learning and growth and specifically growth mindset for our students? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think that's a question that all the educators in the world are asking. <laughs> how do we get people to want to read more, right? Well, what, what we're talking about there is we're talking about intrinsic motivation. How, how do we teach a student to inside want to read? You know, hey, I want to sit down and read a book. Now, I, the reason why I say that's a good question is because I have five children, five kids of my own. Some of those kids love to sit down and read books. Some of those kids, I couldn't get them to sit down and read a book. I mean, they knew how to read, but they didn't want to read. So one thing is to, to teach the children to have success with reading at an early age. And that's what we've discovered. When that child, when they learn the motor in the mouth concept and they read that first word, they are so excited. The light goes on and they are so excited that they want to do more. And then they get a little reading book like, like, like this and they have success where they can actually read it. And because of the success that they have, they like that feeling, they, it's intrinsic motivation. They want to do more. They want to get into the next book. And then they want to get into the next book and they wanna read it to mom or dad and grandma or their dog or their friend or whoever, right? And so I think the answer is that, that success early on breeds more success. And that's what drives that intrinsic motivation inside. Hey, I'm having success. This feels good. I want to do it again. I want to do more. So it's really important to teach kids to read at an early age. If they get where they're struggling, they'll hate reading. If they're in the older grades and they can't, they don't know how to read very well, it's embarrassing. Their self-confidence is shot and they do not want to read. It's hard to break that. So capture them when they're young and that helps with that intrinsic motivation. That's one thought. Yeah. And I, you, you said it, John, and I really believe it. Success is a verb and not a noun. You don't ever, if we can teach kids, success happens, keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. You never reach it. You just keep working it. And by the fact that these kids can take the books home and read to their parents, you know that every parent is going to be thrilled to see his child reading a book. And the child is going to feel very, very proud to be reading something to somebody else and and that's success and success breeds success yeah so i guess if it is an older child maybe you, maybe you give them reading materials that are a couple of years younger say they're in fourth grade 
have them start reading stuff maybe down on the second grade level because then they have success and they want to they'll build they'll build up to where they need to be but you know if i have to sit down and read something on a level that i can't read at i don't want to do that right and i think we have to recognize as educators that we are we're all at different speeds um, like you said, 25 kids in a class, we're all going 25 different speeds. And, and many of the students that we have in these schools that we're talking with, um, many of them, English is not their primary language. And so uh, I think this is a great tool for schools to look at and utilize uh, for, for any, almost any grade level if they're struggling with learning that, that English uh, language. Um, John, do you have any ideas on, I know we talked on it a little bit as far as um, learning that, uh, English is a second language. You know, really what it comes down to is it comes down to, um, reading with the kids either on an individual level or in a small group setting, whichever works best for you as an educator. Ideally, if you can read one-on-one -on -one with a child, that's going to be, have the most impact. Well, sometimes that's not feasible. It just may not work because of your class size and whatever. So maybe you're reading with the kids in small group settings. If it's in small group settings, then you have the ability to talk more about the vocabulary and what it is you're reading and what the words mean, right? It's a little harder to do that in a larger setting. So give them the skills of how to read, spend time teaching them the vocabulary. And that's really... That's that. Those are some some small things. I, I I can't comment too much because I'm not I'm I'm an expert on teaching kids to read, but I'm not an expert on teaching them a second language, <laughs> right? Right. But we do have. Hey hey, look guys, in our schools we do have some kids that come in who don't even speak any English, and they're four years old. They don't speak any English. We just teach them to read, and they're they're. They're sitting there talking to their friends. They're speaking in Chinese and that one's speaking in English. And I don't know how they're communicating, but they are somehow they're playing and they're figuring it out. We teach them to read in English and they, they get it. And, and then their English speaking starts to improve a little bit. And as they grow, they, they learn, but yeah, I guess I'm not giving any real great reason, any great solutions, but. Oh, but I think you gave, I mean, you, you've you experienced that with with uh, some of the students that don't speak English and as they come into your school. And my bet is if you, people utilize this program for any grade level, they would be able to see some success. Because as you learn a second language, that's the same, same types, the same process. And many of us here speak a second language and that's how we had to do it. We had to uh, recognize the letter, and then start uh, learning what it sounded like, and then putting it, and blending it together. So uh, I think it's a, I think it was a great answer. I think it'd be a, uh, an interesting study to do, um, and see how this would work with with students that are older or even adult learners. Yeah, yeah. I think it's time for us to call this to a close. Yep. Uh, John, I want to tell you if you've been reading the comments, the comments that people are making about this presentation are outstanding. And I know there are a lot of people who have really said, wow, that's a whole different way of thinking for me. And you've shown the research and you've shown the program. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you everyone who is with us today. And uh, let's uh, leave with this one. I'll say it again, love what you teach, but love who you teach more. So thank you all for being here today. And we'll see you on March 18th for our next workshop. Somebody said the nice thing about this is it's free. Yeah, it is. And we're happy to present this to you. So uh, we'll be happy March, to come. March 19th. Sorry. Dr. Mar uh, March 19th. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, awesome. uh, so we hope to uh, work with you on the accreditation of your school. But even at that, these workshops are for you. And we want to improve education worldwide. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, John, very much for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you.